each breath that you give, for each moment that you allow. God, for each relationship that you have bestowed. And Lord, the responsibility, God, to glorify you and to honor you in them all. God, as we continue to learn more about what shepherds do, and, and Lord, even the protection from, from wolves that the shepherds provide, God helps be mindful, Lord, of ourselves, mindful of the ministries that you surround us with, God, mindful of you, your will, your perfect good and holy will, Lord, what you call us to do and to be. God, to you be the honor and glory. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we're kind of continuing on in our study of shepherds. And uh, I'm going to open up the same way as I did last week, actually, with the reading uh, from Luke 2. So if you would, please go ahead and turn with me to Luke 2, verses 8 through 14. I will read this uh, just before we go into our main message today. Please remember as I read that this is, this is the Word of God. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. As we explore a little more about, as I've said, the, the Bedouin shepherds that are still practicing much of the original traditions and, and ancient, uh, in, in, in the times of, of the New Testament that span all the way to that time, we're learning more, a bit more about what shepherds might have faced in Scripture. Where right now we are seeing how a shepherd's job can drastically change from one moment to the next. Last week we talked about how they have to navigate a wasteland for water and food for their flocks. And in the same way as we see in Scripture that God Himself is the perfect provider of our provisions. Yes, physical and spiritual. But for the shepherd, when the sun falls, when the moon comes up, the challenge changes from not just hot temperatures, finding shade, food and water, but now, when the sun falls, predators begin to roam the wasteland. More specifically, wolves. And we're going to talk more about that in a moment, but right now I'd also like you to turn to Acts 20. Acts 20, verses 29 through 31. Acts 20, 29 through 31. And if you need help finding a text or something like that, feel free to ask your neighbor. We're here to help. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. Uh, this is a picture actually of a present day Bedouin shepherd with his flock. Now for shepherds of the ancient Near East and the present Bedouin shepherds, when night falls there is 
a checklist of items they must complete before they even think about resting, even for a moment. The first thing they do is that before they start anything, they enclose the flock in a pen, but not just any pen. The pen is actually put right next to the tent. And sometimes those sheep are even tied together loosely with rope. In this way, they're gathered together and protected by being in that larger group. And then because of this group of sheep, not only would it provide the tent a little bit of warmth because of all of those warm bodies, but would also provide them protection. Now, but the shepherd, though, even though he has his tent, he has a, some warmth from the sheep, and there's protection in the way they're gathered together, the shepherd cannot be careless for a moment. Actually, in an interview with one of these Bedouin shepherds, he said this, in camps high on the mountains, shepherds stay awake actually throughout the night. And during the night, you can hear shepherds shouting, whistling, slinging stones in all directions. And these are the precautions they are taking that are completely justifiable as wolves are a source of continual loss for the shepherds. There's even an Arab proverb in the region that goes, at the end of the night, the cries are heard. You see, after wolves are, are trying to steal sheep throughout the evening, once the evening is done, just before the sunlight breaks, that is when the wolves start to howl as the sun is preparing to rise. We have roosters. They have wolves. Which, which, which would you prefer? Roosters. Roosters. Yeah, that's what I thought. Chickens. You can fly them both and not even get eggs. <laughs> but not only do you hear the howls of the wolves, but now the shepherds have to go out to the flock and begin to count. Are they all here? Did I lose any? How many have I lost? And you can hear the cries. Apparently what happens during the evening time is the wolves apparently surround the sheep most nights. They're out there lurking, waiting, and what they do is they actually pluck them quietly. As if a sheep is some, and then if a sheep is somehow separated from that grouping, from that flock, well that sheep then is easy pickings. And they will most certainly be the first to be grabbed. As I was reading about this and, and learning about some of these, these habits of these, these shepherds, I would believe it is at least plausible that even the shepherds we, we read about in the Christmas story could have even been in the process of protecting or even at least vigilantly watching their sheep during that very night, laying in wait for wolves to appear. And imagine, in protecting their sheep from wolves, when suddenly... They're instead, they're grappled with a different kind of fear when, when you see the holiness of, of, of God says he presenting itself through, through angels and song and hallelujah. And then the fear turns into great joy. It was not the, the call of a wolf they hear, but it was the call of the heavenly host celebrating the birth of Christ from protecting against the wolves to celebrating the protection that we have in Christ. Jesus calls himself the good shepherd. And he says that, he, he makes a statement in John 10 where he says, he will never run in the presence of a snarling wolf. In John 10, 11 and 12 he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. It, it's interesting, during, during um, the, the New Testament time period, it was actually expected that a hired shepherd would stand, protect, and defend sheep. And yet Jesus here is saying, no, if they don't own the sheep, they run. It was interesting. This, this came up in one of the interviews with the present-day Bedouin shepherd. He said this. He says, you know, maybe if I was alone with the flock and two or three wolves came, 
I would let the wolf take one and just go. Which is a picture of exactly what Jesus is saying here. And often shepherds do this because really they're also protecting themselves of their own lives and fear of the wolves. But Christ, that he would die for the sheep. That he would stand and yes, sacrifice for the sheep. Rather than run, Christ does this because he is the good shepherd that will and has died and rose again Amen. for his sheep. Now, scripturally, when scripture talks about wolves, it's usually coming from, it's usually to harm communities from the inside facing out. And passages such as John 10 show us that we must carefully handle wolves. Because if we're too passive, or even too aggressive with them, it can cause the sheep to scatter. And if the sheep are scattered and separated, remember what I said about what happens when the sheep are no longer grouped together? They're vulnerable. They're vulnerable when they are scattered. It's devastating to the flock. They are vulnerable to attack when they are scattered. So just as real sheep, if they were scattered, the body of Christ, if not careful of wolves, can also be scattered and become easy picking. I'm going to reread Acts 20, 29 through 31 for you again. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. Where do wolves come from? That's not a birds and the bees type of comment, but uh, where do they come from? Well, first, they arise when God, the accountability, is absent from the outside or the inside of the church, from all those different sources. You know, it's not just like people somehow magically are friends one day and then wolves the next. Usually it also comes down to what we are feeding our minds, our bodies, and our souls. Yes, I do believe our media choices, the way we have conversations and interactions. Much of Scripture deals with false teachers and being unequally yoked and even bound to the wrong people. Psalms 1, right away, talks about following in the footsteps or sitting in the seat of scoffers and liars. It's because everything influences us in some way, and we have to be careful of how much influence those things have on our lives. Example, and this is a big one, and one that you probably don't hear enough from pulpits. Pornography is a huge problem in the general church today and in our entire nation. And it's because that pornography doesn't only change brain chemistry that we're learning, but also our ways of thinking in terms of marriage, what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman. But people are so scared to talk about sex and marriage biblically in the church because it is treated as taboo. Or uncomfortable. Parents, I implore you, I implore you parents, do not neglect to teach your children about God's design and God's intent in terms of healthy marriage and sex. Those are not dirty words. God created them. Be that voice in their lives before someone like a wolf comes prowling and takes your voice from you and from your children. And if the church is silent on those things, you've heard me say this before, if the church is silent on those things, then the world will fill in the gap. And what the world is saying is that pornography and everything it portrays is acceptable and healthy. Though scripture clearly teaches the complete opposite. Yes, 
it will eventually lead to an influence that can lead to change. And that's just one example of how outside influences that are not dealt with biblically, with godly accountability, penetrate the flock and can impact the flock. But what about from inside the church? From inside the church, it comes down to teaching and the examples being set. False teachers, bad authors, kinds of books filled with worldly thinking and corrupt theology. Shepherds and teachers of the church are actually to carefully and discerningly and prayerfully know the Word of God. To be able not only to teach the Word of God, but also to call out and protect the church, to call out bad teaching and be an example of God's Word in action. We're to be living examples of God's Word in action. That's why, um, you know, call out the trustees and deacons. We are to be living examples, focused examples of godly character in the church so that when the flock begins to struggle or they're having trouble remembering things, at least there's, there's a living example right there that's trying to encourage them to remember Christ, both in word, teaching, and yes, deed. Now, what's the best way, though, to deal with wolvishness, to deal with wolves. The best way to deal with this, whether you are finding that there's certain wolfish tendencies in yourself, or you're trying to deal with someone that is struggling in an area of, of either sin or false teaching or bad influence, it's the Word of God. Amen. And it's important that we do, that we spend time in the Word of God, that we know the Word of God. And here's why it's important that you bring the Word of God when it comes to dealing with with wolves. And one, if they are a brother or sister in Christ that is beginning to struggle with something that might be pushing them towards maybe being a little more, I'm going to use the term wolf-like, but yet they still believe the Word of God. Well, then when they hear it, the prayer is then that they will humble themselves before God's Word. And then they may come to a place where either they're going to hear it and immediately recognize that, or they may enter into a holy wrestling match with God and His Word about their life. Um, um, there's a uh, one of the professors over at Moody, Chris Yuan. Some of you have heard of him before. Uh, he was one of the biggest drug dealers in Atlanta, Georgia, and um, as well as a, a proclaimed homosexual. And and um, he actually came to my old church one time. He came and presented his testimony about all that he had experienced. And he was talking about how he was sitting in jail. And, uh, and it, was, it was recreation time. So now he's out walking about. And as he walks by a trash can, he comes across a Gideon Bible inside the trash can. And as he sees that, he pulls it out and he begins to read. He actually didn't like scripture at all. He didn't care. He needed something to do. He was bored. And so all he had was a Bible to read. He's like, well, it's better than nothing. So he starts to read it. And then he went to the prison library and he began to get other books. And he began to, to see God's word about, yes, his, his drug sin, his enablement of harming people. And yes, his homosexual sin as well. And as he looked at Scripture, and as he looked at what the world was telling him, he realized that these two were in complete contradiction. Yes. But he realized, I will humble myself before the Word of God. I will humble myself before the Word of God. Mm -hmm. and, and during the remainder of his time in prison, he got schooling. Um, he left that lifestyle behind. And now he's a seminary professor. And it's, it's, it, it was an amazing testimony to hear him and his parents alongside him share that testimony. If they hear the, if someone loves the word and they love the Lord and they hear that word, they will either listen or they will begin to wrestle. But if they love the Lord, yes, they will submit. We see this in Galatians 6.1. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, this is all sin of all kinds, 
you who are spiritual should restore in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch over yourself, lest you too be tempted. Now, that's the, the happy scenario. If you bring the word of God to someone and they do not submit to God, or you begin to hear them actually twisting God's word, well, then it confirms that indeed there is some wolfishness in them that needs to be dealt with. And Scripture explains uh, church discipline, how to deal with that, Matthew 18, and, and walking through that process. But you need to bring it to the Word of God. And so I say that because we need to remember that as the church, first off, we, we need to be careful that we are not, as the church, that we do not ignore our sin. Or create sin by ignoring real problems. There's a million things in life, listen, this is important, there's a million things in life where it's okay to just brush it off. In fact, probably a lot, most of the things in this life, it is fine to brush off. If someone cuts you off in traffic and it makes you enraged, question, are you going to chase them down in your car and make sure you, you teach them a lesson? I remember one time I got mad while I was holding a Diet Pepsi and someone cut me off. And I'll be honest, I lost my temper and uh, the Diet Pepsi was open. And I kind of slammed the Diet Pepsi on my dashboard. It exploded everywhere. And so as I'm kind of hot with a little bit of anger, I'm not going to say road rage, but I'm hot with a little bit of anger, I'm getting this cold, sticky drench of Diet Pepsi all over me. And I'm just like, okay, God. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. You're right. You're right. Brush it off. Because there's a lot of times when we face problems in this life where there are certain things where if we don't brush it off, we're going to make it worse. There are a lot of things that happen in church that there we do just have to brush off, not because it's sin, but because in actuality it's actually not that important. But there are other times where conversations need to happen. Times where prayers need to take place. Action steps need to be followed. Scripture that needs to always come into play. Prayer that always needs to be brought before God. So yes, God's given us His Word. The sword. The Word of God. To help us. In dealing with, yes, the wolves, the struggles, the conflict. That's why it's important that we do. We take time to read it, study it, and understand what God has given us in His Word. Now, wolves will usually appear within the community. Now, this isn't meant to cause you to turn to um, whomever you're sitting next to and be like, you're a wolf. That's not, the, that's not what I'm getting at. Please don't do that. I see some of you looking at one another like, mm, no, let's not do that today. Please. No, that's not the objective. <clears throat> what I want to say is this. We need to be careful because we need to not forget that wolvish-like behavior can come from within us as well. We have a tendency of seeing things and going straight to blaming another person and attacking another person, but we forget about that plank in our own eye and we forget the important truth that more often than not, that in our own fleshiness and our own sinfulness within us, that is actually causing a lot of the issue. When a person is struggling, a lot of times they don't need you to interject yourself or your way into the problem. What they need is... God's way. They need Christ. They need the Holy Spirit. They need His Word. They need the Holy Spirit to help reveal the issues in their own hearts. And it is from that inner working that, yes, we pray for a repentant spirit. Now, there's a very important question that needs to be addressed here, though. What is the difference between a wolf in the church and just another person struggling with their sin or some church conflict? This is a very important question. Question. And it's answered in this way. One of them genuinely cares about the church and the destruction of another person, while the other does not care about them, their well being, or their destruction as an individual. I'm talking about, yes, a person's well being, the person's fellowship with others, the person's ultimate walk with God. 
You might be in conflict with someone you don't like, but that does not necessarily mean that individual is a wolf in the church. Most people that argue with one another, a lot of times there is somehow a deep down motivation that still cares for their neighbor. But they're trying to seek understanding. They're trying to seek empathy. Or they're trying to seek some kind of bridge with someone, but they don't know what that bridge looks like. And so there's a struggle between people taking place. That's one of the reasons why we're giving Christ to help unite the church. Because amongst ourselves, by ourselves, it by, based on our own motivations, we're more likely to divide one another based on human motivations versus being united with one another in which Christ died for. There is conflict. But the desire to destroy one another is not there. That is why Christ is there as a continual source of unity for the church to rely upon. If you care about your neighbor, you are caring about Christ in them. Now the wolf, however, the wolf, however, does not care for their neighbor, whether they come or they go, whether they're praying for one another. Example, and I've heard this in churches, I've heard it in the business world, I've heard it in just casual conversations with people out and about. You've heard the saying, it's my way, finish it, or the highway. Thank you, I, I, I knew that some of you would know that one. <laughs> my way or the highway. It's a mentality that plagues many people's hearts at work and in the church. That if one person is not on board perfectly with an idea in the church, well then the temptation might strike you to think, well then they're not of us. Throw them out. They're just trouble because they didn't like X, Y, and Z. I will tell you this right now, you must have a very small perspective of Jesus Christ in the church if you believe we have to agree perfectly on everything to be part of the same local church. <clears throat> there is no grace of Christ in the my way or the highway mentality because of how it treats the sheep of Christ. And this is what I mean. Our good shepherd, Jesus Christ, he does not see the sheep as disposable tools for the church. He sees them as blessed children of God, where we have a tendency of looking at one another simply as instruments to an end. Christ sees them as his children. Yes, he gifts, gives them gifts, to do work, but ultimately their identity is in Him. And when we begin to say, my way or the highway, we are robbing that identity and we are saying, you're nothing more than a tool to fulfill my ideas about how things need to be done. Matthew 18, verses 12 through 13, says this, What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine? on the mountains, and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. You know, change is a very natural thing to happen in a church. But you need to know something. God's Word doesn't change. The nature of what the church is to be and what the church is doesn't change. But there are many other things that does change in a church over the years. But change is not the first priority of the church. Change is not the first priority of the church unless it's to deal with sin. The first priority is to God. It's to the teaching of His Holy Word and the care of the flock. And when someone wants to throw someone on the curb in the name of change, they're acting as a wolf. So, so we need to remember this important lesson. Do not immediately assume that the other person is a wolf. Don't presume that just because you're struggling with someone, that that automatically makes them a wolf. Just because you might be having a hard time with a brother or sister in Christ, it does not automatically make you the hero and make them the enemy. It means you might have something to work on together. Some mess of strings to unwind and untangle in a tender sort of way, but it does not make someone a wolf. Now, while there are indeed wolves 
that can arise in conflict? The honest truth is that all of us have the potential to be wolf-like if we lose sight of God's Word. And we let our own word and thinking rule the day without any care for the godly well-being of one another. Intentions. Be careful of your intentions. Intentions don't matter. Because if your intentions are good, but they're unbiblical, and you don't care if it hurts the church, well then you become a wolf. If your intentions are bad and you seek to destroy, well then the foundation of your works is unbiblical and therefore you're wolf like. So what do we do about this then? We see shepherds are vigilant as they watch their flocks by night. And that's exactly what we're called to be. We're called to be vigilant, specifically in two ways. First, I would say this, we're called to be vigilant in the care of one another. Now, why do I say that? Because if the wolves are there to permit the destruction of one another without remorse, then one of the best things we can do to combat such destructiveness is to actively and in Christ care about one another. To be builders of one another in Christ and not destroyers of one another in Christ. <clears throat> and be careful. Because sometimes we have a tendency of categorizing the church. You're old. You're young. You're a city person. You're a country person. You're book smart. You're street smart. And then figure it out, and then, and then we begin to treat them more like, again, a means to an end, rather than the body of Christ. And then we try to figure out how to deal with them. Or if you think they're helpful or not. But, to pray, but we are called to pray and love every person that is part of this body as a child of God who is saved by Jesus Christ, faith alone. And we have many wonderful families in this church. But I would also encourage you to get to know someone that maybe you're not familiar with and simply start by getting to know them a bit. That's a good place to start in letting them know that you care. But be careful to not think about them as some means to an end of a church project or whatever. See them as Christ would see any person who has put their faith in God. They are part of your Christ family. So the first thing is we need to be vigilant in the care for one another. And then the next thing is we need to be careful. We need to be vigilant to the leanings and the desires of our own hearts. Now, this one can be tricky. This one can be tricky. We like to think we know why we do something. But if we're honest, we know the Scripture says that the heart among all things is deceitful. We can actually trick ourselves in thinking we are doing something good, when in fact we might have fallen into a trap of our own making because we're actually self-motivated. God ultimately knows the heart better than we do. Which is why you want the Holy Spirit to test you by the Word of God. Be careful that you have not put yourself so high in your own mind of working with others that you have accidentally forgotten God and the church. And, and not the church as some kind of cerebral concept. Oh, this is the church. No, I'm talking about the flock. I'm talking about your neighbor. They have faces. They have names. You know them. That is the church which God has given you here in Charlotte. And if you're not sure if what you're doing is the godly approach, the biblical approach, or if you're unsure if your motivation is completely right with God, well then go to Him. Bring it before Him in prayer. Openly ask for help and accountability, those things that wolves don't do. And make sure that you consider, yes, Lord, where is my own heart? And make sure you're still caring about God and you still care about the well-being of your brothers and sisters in Christ. Remember the heart of the Lord in all things, at all times. And come to Him ceaselessly, yes, in prayer and spirit of prayer. I want to close with this Christmas thought, and, and like I said, I, I know I mentioned it once already, but it really does minister to me. 
the early shepherds, yes, were very cognizant of the dangers at night and the wolves that would seek to destroy their flocks at night. But God not only provides for them in the wilderness of the day, as we talked about last week, but he protects them and their flocks at all times. The shepherds went from a place of constant fear and death for their sheep to witnessing the most epic announcement of their perfect protection from death eternal in Jesus Christ. In our church, we must make sure that we are not relying on our own way of thinking, but that we are relying on the Word of God, the Holy Spirit, and God's way of thinking as we deal with one another. And yes, we also deal with wolves as well. To God be the glory as we work with one another in this world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your provision, for your protection. God, we're grateful that you lead the way. Lord, help us to listen. Help us to be mindful. Help us to see how you have given us your perfect word that we need to rely upon. God, help us to be vigilant about the care and love of one another. Help us, God, to also be vigilant of the leanings of our own hearts. Help us to seek your face in all circumstances, Lord, and remember to ask yourselves, God, is this, is this how you would call me, Lord, to honor you in such a, such a circumstance? We thank you, Lord, for the birth of your Son, who died and rose again from the dead, who ascended on high. God, that we would be saved for our sins. God, we praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. It was a great time of celebration when we remember all that Christ has done. That he's even willing to die to protect his sheep. And I know that when we rely on his word, when we come to him in humble prayer, when we live by the examples that we are to love one another in the way that he loved us, that we will glorify Him, not by our deed, but by the humble obedience to Him. Thank you. God bless you all.